what's your prediction for the economy and uh, up to the election and after the election in 2015? Well, some of the regional Fed districts have already run surveys on hiring profiles and what people are expecting because they are, you know, unlike the main CPI numbers and the BLS's employment report, these, these guys are kind of interested in the underlying story behind their regional Fed surveys. And so they want to know what the forward impact is likely to be of these policies. And so they've asked this question. And what they found is that there is already a trimming of employment expectations coming from the employer mandate. This was expected. That nobody thought this wouldn't happen. What I haven't seen yet and what's going to be the really critical factor is what this does to hours worked. All right, that's in the big employment report that's that's you know comes out every month. We look at that number, and it's one of the things I track very carefully because tenths of an hour per change in the work week are equivalent to millions of jobs. People don't understand how this works. It's a simple ratio. If you take a tenth of an hour off of everyone's work week. And, and their, and their, you know, their pay per hour stays the same. The amount of money they make goes down. So, you know, you say, well, you know, that's only, you know, six dollars or, you know, two dollars or whatever per person. Yeah, multiplied by 200 million people. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I look at this and say, um, yeah, there's a problem here. And we saw some drawdown when this was first put in and is over the last few months has stabilized. The question is going to be coming in 2015 whether or not we see that take another leg in the downward direction because that has a huge impact in the negative sense on actual earnings and disposable income. And what do you think? Uh, I th Go ahead. I think it's coming. And, and, and you a know, downturn. the, the survey is yeah, downturn downturn coming. I, I think the surveys say it's coming. I think the reality is it's coming. The, the financial impact so far of Obamacare has been relatively muted because of all the exemptions. Now, they, those had not been put in, which, by the way, are illegal, according to the legislation itself. But, you know, the president is not stupid. He's a political animal, and he realizes that the last thing he wants is for these things to get before a re-election bid, right? So, you know, and, and, of course, it's not his, but it's Congress. He doesn't want to see Congress go hard right. And uh, so, you know, the worst of this impact will come after the elections in November. But I, I think coming into 2015, you're going to see a major deterioration in the employment indexes, and and that's bad news for the economy as a whole. Ooh, that's a that's one uh, one sobering prediction. 2015 is going to suck for uh, employment. That's what you say. Well, if, if you're if you're an average worker, yeah, I don't I don't know what it's going to mean for the uh, you know the equity indices and as an investor. One of the things that I found very amusing is the fact that you are increasing systemic leverage dramatically through buybacks and borrowing at allegedly very cheap rates, right, in order to keep the stock prices levitated. And that works just fine right up until the point that it ends. But at some point it must, because if I borrow a million dollars at 10% interest, I have to pay $100,000 a year in interest. If the interest rate then goes to 2%, I can either pay $20,000 in interest or I can borrow another $4 million bucks. Okay, so what has happened over the years, and this has been a 30-year trend, which is one of the reasons you don't see investment managers talking about it, because most of them have never lived in a different world. Neither have most investors. But when that ends, the benign case is that you can't borrow any more money because rates flatline. The malignant case is that rates go up and you have to make a principal pay down in order to be able to afford the same amount of interest coupon you don't have the money to make the principal pay down. Let's say that rates were to go to 4%. Okay, so now I, I can't have $5 million out anymore. I have to pay off enough that my coupon is still hundred grand. Well, where am I going to get the capital from? You're talking about an implosion. When do you think this comes? Um, well, it's very difficult to determine, but mathematics say that that which can't go on forever won't. I expected that the market would have priced in this sort of a change by now, but I'm actually on the contrarian side when it comes to government's, uh, government bond rates. Everyone says they're going up a lot. Uh, you have to realize there's another side to this, which is if the economy sucks severely enough, they will go down instead. We could see a 2% 10-year Treasury rate for the next 10 to 15 years, 
And, of course, the, the problem with that is is that you don't get a 2% Treasury rate for the next 10 to 15 years with a robust economy and good hiring. What you get it with is a 1930s-style depression. You think we're headed for a 1930s-style depression? I think there's a very decent probability of it, yes. And, and the longer that the Fed stays in, involved in their manipulation of market rates, the more likely it becomes. But you only need to look at what's happened in Japan. They tried to machine their way out of a, a regular cyclical problem that they had generated with their own trade policies, and it blew up in their face and resulted in 20 years' worth of stagnation. I, I don't see where people like Bernanke or Yellen, for that matter, can get around mathematics. It's never worked. You're never going to make two plus two equal something other than four. Pretty sobering, my friend. You, and you, do you think this happens in the next couple of years, in the next year? Do you think the economy could fall out of bed? You're talking about a deflationary depression is what you're talking about coming. Well, in, in real terms, yes. The, the problem with the Federal Reserve and fiat currency is that you can, in nominal terms, prevent the deflation. Oh, I'll print tons of money. Okay. So you think they'll print tons you of money? Prevent yeah, the problem with doing it is that you destroy the pension funds and the other fixed income sources that are dependent on this. That's why QE ended. It had nothing to do with the economy. It, it had to do with duration matching in bond portfolios and the fact that those people in fixed income just simply couldn't tolerate any more of the depression of their total return. Uh, you know, everybody likes to talk about Bill Gross being a, you know, a lion of finance, right? And he's, he's now moved from PIMCO. He's, he's leaving there and, and that's all wonderful. What they forget is that all Bill Gross did was take advantage of a 30-year secular trend. He's no genius. He just happened to have a big cudgel, and being the one of the largest asset managers in the world in the government bond market, he could swing his weight around. Well, what happens when he goes to Janus, and, and you know, and all of a sudden he's a little fish in a big pond, and, and there's a lot of sharks. So, uh, you know, and then on top of that, you have the end of this 30-year trend. Can the guy continue to produce the sort of results he's produced when he had everything in his favor into an environment that is much less favorable? We'll see. If so, then he's a genius. If not, he was just somebody that was riding a big wave. Carl Deminger, market-ticker.org. Uh, you know, we'll put up your link to your book, Leverage, which is, was out a couple of years ago. Good read. Uh, we'll also put up a link to your site. Um, Carl Deminger, thanks for coming on and giving us, giving us your analysis and perspective on the economy and the geopolitical situation. We appreciate it. Thank you.